Good morning, Freedom Church. We are so excited that you're here hanging out with us online. Today is going to be an incredible day, and we are so excited that you chose to spend some time with us. My name is Austin, and we would love to get to know you and your name as well. So if you haven't done so already, go ahead and let us know that you're watching right there in the chat. You can just say, hey, I'm new. I'm checking it out. I'm excited to be here. We've got some great people there that would love to welcome you and let you know that we're so excited that you're spending some time here with us today. We know God has a great day in store for us. We are right here in the middle of a relationship hack series, and we've seen God do some incredible things. We know he's going to do some great things today. So let's go ahead and get ready to worship and to celebrate and get excited for what God's going to do. What's up, Freedom? Come on, it's Sunday. We're excited to worship. Let's give God praise. Put your hands like this. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Come on, sing. I praise in the valley, I praise on the mountain. That's right. I praise when I'm sure, I praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. Come on, we sing. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, my soul. I praise. 
praise when I feel it. Hands up. I praise when I don't. That's right. I praise because I know that you're still in control. My praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. As long as I'm breathing, oh, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? We praise Him on the good days and the bad days, the easy seasons, the hard seasons. He's worthy. He's always good. He's always faithful. Come on, sing. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. We'll praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. I praise because you're sovereign. Praise because you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the day. I praise cause you're faithful. Praise cause you're true. I praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Hey, Freedom Church, so glad you are taking a few minutes to spend time with us today and also allowing us to spend a few moments with you. It is offering time around here. Now listen, if you've never walked through the doors of Freedom Church inside this building, whenever we say that it is offering time, literally the entire auditorium starts to clap and to cheer. And occasionally people will ask us, they're like, why in the world are people clapping as a result of you announcing that we're getting ready to do the offering? The reason they do is because God says that he loves a cheerful giver. And for us, when it comes to the idea of being obedient, when it comes to tithing, it is not an obligation. It's not something that we got to do. It's something that we get to do. And so maybe you're watching from home. Maybe you're watching in your car. You might be watching at a coffee shop right now. You should just right now in the middle of that coffee shop, put your hands together and start to cheer because it is offering time. Not really. Don't do that. It's kind of odd, but here's the idea. I want you to understand that being a generous person should produce cheer and joy and happiness in your heart because it's something that you get to do. It's not something that you got to do. You can see all the ways to give right there on the screen, but no matter how it is that you choose to do it, know this, we're grateful for you, we love you, and we are honored that you are part of the Freedom Church family. Now, let's continue with the worship experience together. You're worthy of my song. So I'm gonna live like my King is risen. Gonna preach to my soul that you've already won. And even though I can't see it, oh, I'm gonna keep believing that every promise you. Cause you still 
Stop singing your praise. I'll never stop singing your praise. That's our testimony. And in the blessing and the pain, you are worthy. Whether you say yes or no way, you are worthy. And through it all, I choose to say, you are worthy. I'll never stop singing your praise. I cry away. 
Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we love you, and we're grateful for you. We're grateful that, that you're God, that you're good, that you will never fail. Lord, I thank you that even in any situation where we may find ourselves, whether it's on the top of a mountain or at the lowest of every valley, God, I thank you that you're good, that you're able, that you desire to do incredible things in us and through us and to draw close to us. So God, I pray that that's exactly what it is. That you, would do, that you would do today. Do what only you can do. Help us to walk out of here differently than the way that we were when we walked in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You guys can have a seat. I'm glad that, you're, glad that you're here. Welcome to the second week. Second week? Is this the second week of this series called Relationship Hacks? I think that it is. This is the second week. Yeah, because last week was the first week, and one plus one is two. Therefore, uh, this is the second week of this series. We're grateful uh, for you being here. Thank you for coming to the 9 a.m., uh, which, if you look around, the 9 a.m. looks like the 1015 used to look. And uh, so good job. Great job with that. It's going to lead to challenges. It's going to lead to challenges because now at 1015, I don't get to tell them to come tonight. I don't know what I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them, come to a later time. I don't know. We'll have to figure it out. But either way, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, those of you watching online, good to hang out with you as well. I do need to dive into this series, though, because, uh, or to this message, because if not, we're going to run out of time. We've got a lot to cover. Um, one of the things that we do twice a year uh, is we go out on a message planning trip, basically, where we map out kind of the next six months to 12 months of series. And then we try to make as much ground as we can on individual messages and um, before we do those two things, we always send out something online, something on social media saying, hey, what is it that you want us to speak on? What is something you would love for us to talk about in the context of Freedom Church, like on a Sunday? And without exception, every single time, it doesn't matter if I were to ask the question 10 months in a row, the number one thing that comes back every single time is relationships. Every time. There has not been an exception as of yet. There's been other things that have vied for number two, uh, but number one is always relationships every time. And 
we ask the question, we're like, why are people so concerned with relationships? And I think one, because everybody's in relationships, whether it's friendships, parent, child, uh, romantic type relationships, whatever the case may be, we all live in the realm of relationship. Uh, but two, I just think there's some ridiculously terrible and horrendous advice out there when it comes to relationships, and people are begging for, what is it that is true? What is it that God's word actually says about it? Because I'm tired, I, like, thankfully, people, hopefully, I hope that I'm not just imagining this, but I feel like people are starting to get tired a little bit of just TikTok advice from people uh, who have these clips, and you hear it, and you're, like, seeing all these people that are commenting about how good it is, but when you take a step back, and you look at it, you're like, that was the dumbest, the dumbest thing that I have ever heard. You think about, uh, for example, let's, and, and I know some of this is gonna, this is gonna make you sad. It doesn't need to make you sad, this particular portion. Some of you love The Bachelor, right? You love it. Uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with loving The Bachelor. It's totally fine, as long as you love it for entertainment purposes. And that's not where it is that you think romanticism lives, right? Like if you think The Bachelor is romantic, something is wrong with your meter when it comes to that. Because you think about what The Bachelor is. You get a guy in a situation where he gets to date casually 30 some odd women at the exact same time, which is, I mean, if you think that's normal, that's not normal. Then he's making out with like a third of them, like 10 of them. And if you think that's normal all at the same time, that's not normal either. Then he narrows it down to two people that he falls in love with at the same time. That also should not be normal. Two people he falls in love with. And then at the end, he's like, but I'm going to give you a rose. Right, like that is not, hopefully, I hope, I hope when you watch it, you watch it for the entertainment value and you're not watching it, writing down and taking notes about how it's supposed to be. Because that is not really how life is supposed to work. It certainly is not how relationships are supposed to work. Sometimes we get advice from like well-intentioned friends uh, and have you ever noticed sometimes we take advice from people who absolutely know nothing about what it is they're talking about, but they are so passionate about it. They are passionate about that which they do not know. It's like going out and going to the gym and getting a personal trainer that is 400 pounds overweight. Like, obviously, if you're going to get a personal trainer, for me, if I'm getting a personal trainer, I want the guy or the girl uh, to be jacked. You know what I mean? Like, I want to have a poster of them on the wall and be like, I want to look like that guy. That's going to be my trainer. If I'm getting financial advice, you know who I'm getting financial advice from? Not somebody that lives in a school bus because they have to. Like, I'm getting financial advice. I'm getting financial advice from a rich guy. That's who I'm going to get my financial advice from. That's why I think it's so funny when somebody that can barely afford to walk outside their front door always disses on Dave Ramsey and talks about how terrible Dave Ramsey is. I'm like, really? Because when I compare the two of you, I feel like he might be doing better than you. Does this make sense? So I'm going to get my advice from people who are doing well. If I'm getting marriage advice, I want to get marriage advice from somebody who's been married longer than me and somebody who's been doing really well at it. doesn't mean it's perfect, because here's what you need to know when it comes to marriage. There is, not, there is no such thing as a perfect marriage. Maybe the first seven days, maybe the honeymoon phase. Like, you can nail the honeymoon, right? Like, that part's fine. But when you get home, like, all of a sudden, it's not going to be as perfect as you might have thought that it was going to be. Why? It's not because you married the wrong person. It's because you're two imperfect people joining together. And when two imperfect things get together, you don't complete each other. You compete with each other. And so as a result, like we need, we need some good real deal thoughts about relationships. And I think there is a better way to do this. And the better way is to like load up on wisdom from the person who created us and the person who created marriage. I just figured the guy who invented it probably knows the most about it. Is that, is that fair to say? The guy who invented it knows the most about it. If I buy a car and I know the guy who invent, literally invented that car, I'm going to take advice about that car from the guy who invented that car. I'm going to take that person's advice over any YouTube video that's out there. I'm going to take advice from the one who created it. God created us. He created marriage. It was his idea. And as a result, I just feel like that's probably the one we should go to when we're trying to figure out how to do this thing well. Now, full disclosure, what I wanna to try to do today is I do wanna make sure, I said this last week, but I wanna say it every week of the series probably, marriage is not the ultimate goal. You need to know that. From God's word, marriage is not the ultimate goal. Marriage is also not the purpose for your life. 
You are not just created for marriage. And if you don't get married, you're not fulfilling your purpose. You can be single and purpose-filled and content and happy for the rest of your days. And that is okay. And the reason I say that is just because sometimes I think in churches, like sometimes churches, and I don't mean like one in particular church, I just mean the church at large, doesn't necessarily do a good job of acknowledging that. We talk about relationships a lot and we talk about marriage a lot and dating and all these things. But there are some of you who you're single, content, and happy, and that's how God created you, and that's how he made you, and that is a actual, according to God's word, that's actually like a bonus. That's actually something that gives you a little bit of a heads up and a little bit of a step forward because there's just a lot less things you have to worry about in this life. I'll show it to you just so uh, in case you don't believe me, uh, which I don't know why you wouldn't believe me, but <laughs> if you don't, I'm just going to read it to you. First Corinthians 7, 7 says this, I wish that all of you were as I am. How am I? He was what? Single. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another that, or another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Why? Singleness, according to the Apostle Paul, is a gift. Some of you are like, yeah, that's a gift. It's a gift I want to return because I don't like that gift. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So here's the whole purpose for me saying this one little caveat is that being married is not your ultimate purpose in life. Your ultimate purpose in life is to follow Jesus, whether you're single or you're married, right? That's our purpose. Our purpose is to passionately follow after the heart of God. But statistically, most people are going to get married. Statistically, most of you want to get married. And so we're going to talk to people uh, where they are, and that is where we are. That's where I am. I am very married, and I am very happy about it. And uh, if singleness was, it was not a gift that God has given me. He's given me some gifts. That was not one of them. Uh, For that, I'm actually grateful. But uh, three qualities that I think we need before we're going to get married. So let me tell you how this is going to work. If you're not married, You need to get this before you get married. If you already are married, you need to start working on these three things uh, as if you were doing it on the front end. You just have to do a little bit of catch-up work. Is that that fair? Say yes. yes. So that's the goal. Three qualities before you get married. Because the goal, it's not about trying to find the right person as much as it is trying to become the right person. And when you become the right person, God will start leading the right person to you. The problem is some of us, we have these goals and these ideals in our mind of what it is we want. We want a godly man. We want a godly woman. We want to be able to have a great marriage. But based on how some of us are living our lives, the person that we're looking for is not looking for us. So we got to become the kind of person that the person we're looking for is actually looking for. And so that means that we got to work on ourselves. This whole thing about getting ready for being, getting ready for marriage is less about trying to find the right one and it's more about becoming the right one. And when we do, what's going to end up happening is uh, that we're going to be able to say the following things. Like if we can say these three things, then we're moving in the right direction right? Here's the the first one. Number one, I am secure in Christ. I'm going to explain it in a second, but I am secure in Christ. If you want to end up being married and happy, you need to start single and secure. If you're going to be married and happy, you need to be single and secure. Now, if you're already married and you're like, oh, I'm already married and I've been married for like 20 years. And honestly, my security comes in a lot of other things. That's okay. What we're going to do is we're going to say, God, we need your help And even though it's not something that we have done previously, it's something we want to work on now. I want my security to be found in my relationship with God, not my relationship with someone else. Because if your security comes in being in relationship, you're going to bounce around from from relationship to relationship. It's going to be about quantity over quality for you. Because you're going to bounce around from person to person trying to figure out what it is that you want and trying to figure out what it is that's out there, and you're going to think that every time you get that person that you've been quote-unquote looking for, once you wrap your arms around them, you're going to be like, oh, I found them. And then what you're going to find out is you found them all right. It just wasn't necessarily the right one. Our security has to come 
from our relationship with God. We are complete in Christ. He is the one that makes us complete, not some other person. And if you don't grasp that, you're gonna have expectations on another person that they could never fulfill. Because her name is Jenny, not Jesus. Or his name is Jose, not Jesus. Actually, if he's of Spanish descent, he could be Jesus, but it's pronounced Jesus instead of Jesus. Some of us, we have this savior complex and we end up self-sabotaging relationships because we're trying to put on somebody else what they were never meant to carry. I can't be Jesus to Devin and Devin can't be Jesus to me. I have to be complete in Christ. She has to be complete in Christ. And then as a result, the two of us will be drawn closer together. That's the way that this thing is supposed to work. So when you're insecure, when it comes to relationships, what insecure people do is they need more and they settle for less. Insecure people need more and they settle for less. And you're looking for Mr. or Mrs. Right. But if you're insecure, you end up settling for Mr. or Mrs. Right Now. And Mr. or Mrs. Right Now can be a lot different than Mr. or Mrs. Right. Now, I know it's 9 o'clock, and I know we're talking about relationships, and I know it's kind of a heavy topic sometimes. But by doing this, it helps me to know that you are still alive. It helps me. It helps me. I'll preach better and faster if I get a little bit of feedback. So it's, it's really, really helpful for you to be... Uh, participatory when it comes to this whole thing. But when it comes to relationships, if you are insecure, you're going to need more and settle for less. That's why so many people have such low standards. The, the standard can't be that everything is intact, they have a face, and they know how to use their words. <laughs> like the standard has to be higher than that. I mean, does it not? I mean, it should be. I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be. The problem is, maybe the problem is that for a lot of people, it's not that way. Or it is, no, the problem is that it is that way, actually. For us, for me, for you, what I want for you, those of you that are still at the point in your life where you can course correct this on the front end, what I would love for you to do is for your standards to be elevated actually, that you would realize that who you are as a follower of Jesus, and when you realize who you are and whose you are, your standards begin to rise. So for example, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and 10, for in Christ, that means if you're a follower of Jesus, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Watch this, and you have been made complete in Christ. You've been made complete. Now, the reason that that's so difficult for people to believe is because culture tells us differently. Culture says you got to find your soulmate. You gotta, there's one person out there for every single person, just one. And if you mess it up, you're going to literally marry the wrong person and mess up humanity from this point forward. <laughs> the problem is you got to understand that the whole concept of, of having a soulmate is somewhat ridiculous because if if life was contingent upon every single person marrying that one exact right person, and that's the way it's always been, you need to know that this far into the world's existence, it would have already been too late for us. Because somebody 2,000 years ago is certainly going to marry the wrong person, and then that means he's married to the wrong person. That means she's married to the wrong person. That means that the people that they were supposed to be, are supposed to be married to are going to be married to the wrong people. And on and on and on and on it goes. And by the time you get to us, we're just kind of uh, left in the reject bin, all of us. <laughs> Does this make sense? Like The reality is that we have been made complete in Christ. And because we've been made complete in Christ, no matter what culture tells us, we know that we have been given every single thing that we need, not only to be a follower of Jesus, but to follow him well with steps of faith along the way. Culture tells us that we gotta have some soulmates. Sometimes the church doesn't necessarily do a great job because uh, sometimes they accidentally communicate that you're not complete until you're married. The devil himself, you know what he says to you? He says, you're still single? My gosh, you're still single? You're 51 years old. Something must be wrong with you. Well, if you start believing that something is wrong with you, 
then your standards, are they going to get higher or are they going to get lower? Lower. The devil himself is trying to ruin your marriage before it even starts. He's trying to make you so insecure that your standards are so low that you end up traveling down a road that you never intended to travel, which will lead you to a destination that you never intended to arrive at. And so we've got to get to the point where we can say, I am complete in Christ. Listen, if no one has told you this, if you are a follower of Jesus, you are complete. You are whole. You have every single thing that you need to do every single thing it is that God has called you to do. You have infinite value, not just because of who you are, but because of whose it is that you are. And God did not make a mistake when he created you. God knew what he was doing, faults and all. Somebody, somebody told me this. They're like, hey, when God called you into ministry, he had already taken into account all your flaws, and he still did it. The same is true for all of you. He knows everything about you, and he still chooses to love you more than you could ever possibly imagine. You are loved by God. You are complete. You are whole. You are worthy. You are forgiven. You are loved. All the things... That's who you already are. You don't have to work for that. That's who you are. It is a right given to you by God because when God sent his son down to this earth to live and to die and to be risen from the dead, when Jesus took your sin upon the cross, he gave his righteousness to you. That means that when God looks at you, if you're a follower of Jesus, he doesn't see you according to your worst day. He sees you according to Jesus's best day. And when he sees you according to Jesus' best day, that means he's like, ah, even when you've done some stupid stuff, and I bet you have probably even this weekend, even in the middle of your stupidity, Jesus was like, I like that one. That's my boy or that's my girl. Why? Because when God looks at you, he sees Jesus, not your sin, because your sin has already been taken care of. Big old giant if, it's only two letters, but it's big, if you're a follower of his. That's the caveat. So, I am complete in Christ. Remember, insecure people need more and settle for less. Secure people need less and expect more. It's okay to have high expectations. Honestly, some of the expectations seem high and they're not. It's like, do you passionately follow Jesus? That should be the number one expectation for anyone in terms of a potential boyfriend or girlfriend one day or a potential spouse one day? Do they passionately follow Jesus? If not, and you still choose to go down that road, it means your standards are too low. It doesn't mean if they're a follower of Jesus or if they're not and you are that you're better than them. It's not what that means. But as a follower of Jesus, he makes you better than you. He who lives inside of you because of the Holy Spirit makes you better than you would have been trying to do this life alone. And so we've got to find our security there. Our purpose is not in marriage. Our purpose is to follow Jesus. Our purpose is not to find the right person. Our, pers our purpose is to become the right person. That's our goal. So I am secure in Christ. When I'm, in, when I'm secure in Christ, I know I don't have to lower my standards. I don't have to compromise my values. I don't have to get in a situation uh, where you have to trade your body for love. You don't have to do that anymore when your security is found in Christ. You don't have to do it anymore. Number two, second thing you got to be able to say before you get married, I am strong in character. I am strong in character. Now, again, remember what I said at the very beginning of this message. If you're already married and you're like, man, I wasn't even thinking about it. This wasn't even on my radar when I was dating and when I got married. That doesn't mean anything necessarily. What it means is you need to start working on that now. I am strong in character character. If you're young, the tendency is to say what's common is that I am going to have fun now and then I'm going to get serious about Jesus later. First of all, that's a misconception that uh, is pretty prevalent among people that following Jesus is not fun and is not the greatest thing on this planet because I promise you that it actually is. But so many people are like, I'm going to do whatever it is I want to do now and I'm going to follow Jesus later. You cannot build a life of righteousness on a foundation of sin. Like, that's not the way that life works. That's not the way that a relationship with God works at all. So what does strong character look like? It's not as complicated as some people like to make it sound. Paul tells his little, his protege, Timothy, here's what he says. 
First Timothy chapter four, verse 12, the back half of it, set an example for the believers in speech. That means the words that you use, right? Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now, are we gonna get this right every time? No, we're not gonna get this right every time. There's, there's gonna be times, like if you're like me, we have a pretty sports-heavy culture here. When I go to, I'm way better than I used to be, by the way. I am gonna give myself credit when it comes to umpires and such. I am so much better than I used to be. But there was a day, every single baseball game was an opportunity for much sin uh, when it comes to the words coming out of my mouth, right? I will say I have only been kicked out of one game, just one, and it happened somewhat recently last year. But of all the games I've been to, I've been to thousands of baseball games. Only getting kicked out of one, that's an accomplishment. And those of you that are in the sports world, you know that to be true. It's true. Only getting kicked out of one, that's, that's like trophy level uh, stuff. <laughs> trophy level. I should get a trophy for only getting kicked out one time. And the game I got kicked out of was ridiculous. I had been way worse than that before and did not get kicked out. I am strong in character, strong in character. Point is, moving forward. I'm not where I wanna be, but I'm not where I used to be. Does that make sense? We celebrate progress. We celebrate progress around here. So sure, you're gonna fall down. You're gonna say some stuff you wish you didn't say. You're gonna do some stuff you wish you didn't do. You're gonna think some things. You're like, where did that even come from? Have you ever thought something so crazy it surprised you? You were like, whoa, the first thing that came to my mind was like triple homicide. Like, how did that happen? And if you've ever driven in Atlanta, you know you've thought it before. But I am strong in character and my beliefs determine my values. What that means is I might think it, but I'm not gonna do it. There's an old phrase that says, you, you can't, this is a hilarious phrase, but it, it works. Um, you can't stop a bird from landing on your head, but you can keep him from building a nest in your hair. I mean, for me, that's extra easy, but <laughs> you can keep him from doing that. You can't help what pops into your mind sometimes, uh, but you as a follower of Jesus can say, ah, oh, I probably shouldn't go down that road. I probably shouldn't continue down this path. You say, why does this matter so much? Your beliefs determine your values. So when you're getting ready to decide, is this the person that I'm gonna date? Is this the person that I'm gonna marry? Is this the person that I'm gonna have kids with? What they believe is going to affect what they value, which is going to affect how they parent. Amen. It's gonna affect what they believe about money. It's gonna affect what it is that they spend their money on, what they're willing to go into debt for. It's going to affect their church beliefs. Is church something you do because God tells you to do it and because you want to surround yourself with the right people? Or is it an option for you and it's something you do only when the weather's not perfect and the lake hasn't been brought back up to where it's supposed to be so it's not really safe for your boat? Because if you are following hard after the heart of God and you get with somebody who sees that as an option, there's going to be some challenges down the road. There's going to be some challenges. Oh, but I'll fix them when we get married. No, you won't. You won't fix them. God might fix them, but you're not going to. Because your name is Susie, not Savior. <laughs> you're a way better Susie than you are a Savior. I don't know where I come up with these names. Susie. <laughs> Susie and Savior, they both start with S. It's going to affect how you treat people. It's going to affect what you prioritize. It's going to affect the kind of friends you have. It's going to affect what, they, what it is that they believe about divorce. I think that God gives us a few reasons that a biblical divorce is mandated, not mandated, but it is necessary potentially. Sometimes where it is uh, something that biblically we are allowed to do, but I think it's fewer reasons than what our culture says. And if you're married to somebody who sees divorce as the first option of an exit strategy, it's going to be a challenge for you down the road. But your beliefs determine your values. That's why we have to make sure that we are surrounding ourselves with a person who has the same values and the same beliefs that we do so that we can trust the Holy Spirit to be working in and through their heart and life as well. 
just like they are, just like he is yours. For sake of time, let's go to number three. I have strength in my circle. I have strength in my circle. You got to be able to say that before you get married. I have strength in my circle. The strength of your circle will shape the quality of your marriage. The strength of your circle will shape the quality of your marriage. In other words, show me your friends. I'll show you your future. Who are you friends with? I can tell a lot about a person I've never hung out with based on the people that they hang out with. Are the people that you're surrounding yourself, are they men or women of character? Are they trying to move down the same road? Are they going in the same direction that you are? Why is this so important? Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. In other words, God is literally saying to us, if we have goofball friends, play stupid games, you get to win stupid prizes. That's true about your friendships. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Walk with the wise and become wise. That's why I want to surround myself with people who are wise. You, you, do you know you can be wise without even being all that smart? There are some people who are brilliant, but they don't have a lot of wisdom. For a companion of fools suffers harm. So what I want to do is I want to find friends that have a good marriage. I want to be able to bounce ideas off of them. I want to be able to ask them questions. I want to be able to just watch them. How do they interact? How do they handle conflict? Not do they get it perfect every time. Matter of fact, I am leery of people who have never been through anything. If you've never been through a real deal struggle, I am a little bit like, I don't know if I can trust your advice yet. Because I need, I need to hear from some people who have been through some stuff. Are they plugged into church? The reality is the life you have is a result of the circle you run with. You know, we've done girls' night for years. We've never done a guy's night. We're doing guy's night May the 9th is when that's going to be. Why are we doing? I didn't, honestly, I haven't wanted to do it for a long time. And this year I was like, it's time. And the reason it's time is because we live in a culture that is attacking, actively attacking what it means to be a biblical man. And so as a result, what we're going to do, and, and four of you clap, but, but in a couple, in a couple <laughs> weeks, once we get through that guys' night event, everybody will clap. You know what's the worst part about being actively attacked is when you don't know you're being actively attacked and you just kind of take the beating. So it's going to be a night just for guys, and I'm going to go after it. In, in ways, I'm going to say some stuff that I probably wouldn't say in mixed company. Because sometimes like when, when there's females in the room, I'm like, I temper myself just a little bit, as you should. But when it's just guys, we can go. We can go. And we're going to go. So if you haven't signed up, we, we will sell out. So on the, you come to the 9 o'clock, so this is good news for you. On the back of your chair, there's a QR code. Just take your phone out. And you can register, like you can register now. It won't even distract me because I see everything you do anyway. <laughs> so I know, I know as the day goes on, the masters will be on. And people are, I'm taking notes, pastor. Oh, are you? <laughs> so we have mirrors in the screen. I can see, I'm just kidding, we don't. <laughs> Ceiling is what I meant to say. I can see your screen. We don't. But sign up for that. It'll be a lot of fun. Why do we do it? Why are we doing it? Well, I'm trying to think, why am I promoting this? Because I want there to be strength in your circle. I want you to meet, my goal with God's Night is for you to meet like just two or three people. I don't, not 10. 10's too many. Just two or three where you're like, I actually like that guy. They're, they're normal. They're not weird. They do some of the same stuff I do. They're not like strange you know, because sometimes people are strange. How many of you know some strange people? Look, if you don't have your hand up, 
Like if you don't know the strange person, everybody might have been raising their hand about you. Because I think like 33% of the country is strange. I mean, look to your left, look to your right. If it's not them, And that's okay. The Lord loves all strange people. <laughs> I'm secure in Christ. I'm strong in character. I have strength in my circle. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. Because, you know, I can preach this stuff. This is one of the funniest things about being a pastor. It's very strange. Because I'm on the same journey you're on, but I'm also trying to lead us together. I don't get all these three things perfectly right all the time. I know them cognitively, but implementation of what you cognitively know is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. I think a lot of us have a lot of knowledge. What I'm asking God to give us all is some wisdom to be able to put some of this stuff into practice. That's what I'm praying. So that when those of you that aren't married yet, but you're going to get married, or those of you that are married, what you can decide is Psalm 34, 3, glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Ultimately, that's what marriage is all about. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And when we do, and our standards are high, our security is in Christ, we won't settle. It's not quantity over quality anymore. This thing that we want down the road, we can reverse engineer our life so that we start building towards that right now. Because you don't live like a fool for 20 years and then accidentally fall into wisdom. It's a process that God takes you through. He doesn't take you around it. He takes you through it. It's a whole nother series for a whole nother day. Do me a favor, stand to your feet. If you would, I'm gonna pray for you. When I pray, the band's going to sing. They'll do what they do. <laughs> but again, thank you for coming to the 9 o'clock. Y'all are awesome. I, this is going to cause full net problems. So we're working on it. We're working on what does, what happens once all three, the other two are completely full, people meeting out in the lobby. This one's pretty close. Uh, so we're working on it in the meantime, before we build this building, which we're working on. Update coming very, very soon. You saw the trees are down. Wasn't that wonderful? I was so happy. I was so happy. I've never been so happy to watch trees fall down in my entire life. Because for months I had been praying that God would send a tornado through there and it would, everybody would be safe, but not the trees. I wanted the trees to go away. Dear Lord, I love you and I'm grateful for you and I pray for every person here today. I pray that you would continue to give us the boldness and the courage that we need to do what it is that you called us to do. God, I pray that people would trust your plan, that you really do have a better plan for them than they do for themselves. And so God, I pray that you would elevate our standards, raise our standards because our security is in Christ, not in some other person in this room because you are God and you are good. And we trust you with everything that we've got. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
incredible day. I know God has been moving. I know that it's been so helpful and so refreshing, so encouraging and challenging to be able to hear his word today and be able to take that and apply it to our lives. We know God's going to use it in a powerful way in your life. And one of the things that we want to ask you to do, if you haven't done so already, take just a moment 
and find the different ways to give right here on the screen. We would love for you to be a part of investing in what it is that we're doing as a church to continue to bring messages like this to people like you. And that way we can continue to see lives change. We know God's got a great week in store for us. We can't wait to see what he's going to do next Sunday. Be sure to join us then. We love you, Freedom Church. Have a great day.